so uh, we all know Jack has a great resume. Um, I'll go through some of it. Mayor Wilton Manners, member of the State House of Representatives, three-term mayor of Fort Lauderdale, graduate of St. Anthony's, Cardinal Gibbons, Notre Dame, University of Miami, great wife, Susan, four amazing kids, Mariana, Jacqueline, Preston, and Suzanne. What I'd like to uh, highlight in Jack's resume, though, is uh, an election that's not really on his resume. It would, um, this election uh, best shows Jack's political skills, and it probably gave him the confidence to do as well as he has to date. And it was in 1975, sixth grade class president, St. Anthony's. Okay? <laughs> this, is, this is really uh, insightful. Uh, so Jack... In 1975, Jack transferred to St. Anthony's from St. Coleman's in Pompano. And uh, so here he is, he's a new guy on campus. Uh, who graduated from St. Anthony's in here? I know Billy, me, Jack, a few other. Anyway, St. Anthony's in 1975, the campus, Jack shows up on campus, the campus was two oak trees, a chin-up bar, and a bunch of broken glass. <laughs> it was a beat up old grade school. No AC, it was really a mess. So Jack shows up on campus, and he runs for president of the sixth grade. He's been on ca campus for a day. <laughs> okay, so he's the new man on campus. Very bold. His opponent is Brenda Taylor. Um, Brenda had been planning to be the sixth grade class president since halfway through the fifth grade. And uh, wasn't happy to see the new guy show up, and was like, man, my campaign's a now I got a competition. She had her team and thought it'd be a landslide slide. So Brenda was caught off guard and she could not have anticipated the smooth talker from St. Coleman's showing up. <laughs> Brenda was an aggressive candidate and even resorted to some negative tactics in calling Jack an interloper. <laughs> a carpetbagger from up north. <laughs> St. Coleman technically is north of St. Anthony. <laughs> anyway, Jack won the sixth grade election after being on campus for about two days. And it showed his uh, skill as a, as a candidate, his campaign prowess and his confidence. It all started in 1975. So it all came together for, through that first election. And uh, it's, everything else has been, since been history. Um, so what can we as executives learn from Jack? And I have a quote from Stephen F. Hayward, who wrote a book uh, called Churchill on Leadership. So here's the quote I like. While the business executive can look to the bottom line as a North Star, the political executive confronts a milky way of competing and shifting priorities, requiring a full measure of judgment, vision, and persuasive skills. So, as easy as our, as tough as our job is as executives to run a business, it, it is, is, it is much, much easier compared to being um, in the, the political arena. And I think that the, those words in that quote really help define leadership. And I think of all the uh, things we can say about Jack, he's a great leader. Good judgment, vision, and persuasive skills. So Fort Lauderdale is very fortunate to have Jack as its mayor. He's a great leader. Um, Fort Lauderdale has been well led and is prospering. So I think Jack has a great future in Florida. He's a great friend and also a statesman. Here's Jack. So what Danny didn't tell you is that he was Brenda Taylor's campaign manager. So. <laughs> I appreciate you running her campaign, Dan. That was yeah. nice. That was good. Um, <laughs> all seriousness, good morning. It's, uh, it is awesome to be here. And as I was listening to you all do your introductions, it hit me. I said, um, you know, you guys are Fort Lauderdale. We talked about this a little bit last year, but it is amazing. I mean, I, I, I heard Ed get up and, you know, we dishonored your dad, Stan, at City Hall the other day. Stan Smoker was put in uh, all time into the... Uh, city uh, recognized individuals, distinguished uh, citizen category. I hear Ted Drum speak. I realize how many years your family has made such a difference here in Fort Lauderdale and just run through it. John, even with your new grill off, I mean, already doing it a couple years and it's become the most talked about event in town. I mean, people just uh, love it. And you listen to all you, and I don't think you realize 
how significant this group is. I don't think you all realize that when you get up and you ask me to speak and then the Dan says, you know, what can you learn from me? It's what we learn from you. We learn from you all that this is how you build community. This is what Fort Lauderdale is all about. It's not building community downtown. It's building community in the business community, building community out in the community, trying to move this city forward. And um, it's just amazing. I'm honored to be here this morning. I wish my dad was here. I think you all know he's been dealing with some um, chemotherapy. He just finished up, and hopefully, uh, you know, he'll be doing okay. Keep him in your prayers. But that's why he's not here this morning. He really wanted to be here. Let me just a uh, couple thanks in addition to the, the drums and the smokers I just mentioned. One, Kathleen Cannon. What an amazing event. I don't know how many of you all made it to the grand opening of the new Mission United facility the other day, but what the United Way has done for our veterans and what individuals in this community have done for our veterans, it's awesome. And if any of you are veterans, let me thank you now. I know it's, uh, we just celebrated Veterans Day last week, but this is an opportunity, and you, Mr. Drucker, you talk about your son. You know, we live in this country with the greatest lifestyle, the greatest quality of life, because of what our veterans do. And so Kathleen, the United Way has stepped up for those veterans. We've got others that have stepped up with Operation Lift Hope and various groups, but uh, it's fantastic what we do for our veterans now. And at Veterans Day the other day, it hit me. I said, you know, about 30, 40 years ago, the veterans came back and they were completely unappreciated. Veterans came back and we'd look at them as a community and say, you know, boy, they were off fighting a very unpopular war. And so now these are unpopular veterans. And I'm so proud today the way we have changed that. The veterans come back, you have the Veterans Day ceremony, you're in the community, and they come back heroes, as they should be. And I just hope we continue that. I hope uh, the next generation continues that tradition of honoring those, despite what situations we put the veterans in, we put them there. And we better damn well support them when they come back from whatever duties they're doing for this country. So keep that up. Let me just um, also touch on one other item just to as I sit here at this uh, yacht club and I look out and I see the, all the water, uh, we just came off an unbelievable boat show. How many of you all made it down here? Yeah, let me give you an idea of the numbers to give you uh, the impact of this. I had a lot of people call me last week and say, man, traffic's terrible here in town. I said, I know, but you know, it's also bad here in the driveway here at uh, <laughs> Coral Ridge Yacht Club, so. Uh, but in all seriousness, it is amazing the impact of that show just to give you an idea there was over a half a billion dollars in economic impact from that show there was over four billion dollars in product here on the water in fort lauderdale think of that number four billion dollars this is an industry that each year generates in the south in the broward county area about nine to ten billion dollars we're in the middle of an economic study right now but it's an industry that generates about nine to $10 billion in economic impact. Give you an idea, tourism is probably our biggest industry right now. It's generating probably around uh, about $11 billion, but right behind it, very close, is that marine industry. So as much as you got frustrated by the traffic, got frustrated by maybe not being able to get into your favorite restaurant or your favorite uh, um, store because of that traffic, keep in mind, they, they're leaving behind a half a billion dollars in economic impact just out of that one event. Hugely successful. Let me just uh, tell a little bit of an update on the city, give you an idea of what's happening. It's been a um, fantastic year. The number I'm most proud of this year is 4.9%. Um, and that's a number that you all created. That's a number that you're responsible for. That 4.9% is the unemployment rate in Broward County. It is the lowest unemployment rate in every major metropolitan area in the state of Florida. It is substantially lower than what we see in Palm Beach County. It's lower than what we see in Miami-Dade County. It is lower than the state average and lower than the national average. And that's the unemployment rate you all have created. All this talk about, hey, thanks for the referral, thanks for the work, thanks for the business. Every time that happens, every time one of you has to expand their, your business, hire somebody else, you're lowering that rate. And I tell you, that's the rate, as I said, I'm most proud of because when you look at everything we can do for anybody in this world, for any family, for any friend, is to find them a good job, good employment. We spend all this time with all these social issues, all these other economic issues, and really the only number that really matters is the unemployment rate. People are working, people are feeling good, people have self-esteem. People are working, are able to support their families, they're able to move forward. I had talked to the White House Office of Intergovernment Affairs about two years ago. 
And at that time, we had an unemployment rate around five and a half, maybe a little higher. And I remember them saying, well, you'll never get below five again. Because that five is a new, it's kind of the new low. It's sort of the floor. And because of technology, because of the way the economy has changed and shifted, you'll never get below five again. And so when we hit that 4.9% number last month, that month, I sent a text up to Jerry Abramson, who heads up the White House office, and I said, hey, Jerry, what were you saying about that 5% number? Texted him, he wrote back, he says, this is fantastic. And it is true, we need to see that unemployment rate stay in the four. The other number let me hit you with is 70. Who knows what 70 is? 70 straight, well, I know Mike Weymouth knows back there, he runs a hotel. 70 straight months of tourism growth in Fort Lauderdale. Put that in perspective, that is two months shy of six straight years of tourism growth. It has been an amazing run. We talk about the marine industry, the impact of that, the growth they've had coming back, the biggest boat show ever, huge economic impact. Our tourism industry sustained us through this whole downturn. Our tourism industry is what took us through, kept the employment rate where it was because we were able to at least bring people here. And it's been an amazing run. I hope we can continue that 70 straight months. I know Mike hopes we can continue that 70 straight months. But again, that's another industry that a lot of times you all, and I know it's tough because you, you want to be able to move around town, you want to get places. But just like that marine industry with the boat show, our tourism industry does create some day-to-day -day roadblocks, day-to-day -day headaches, day-to-day -day stress on our community. But let's not lose sight of that number either, that the fact of 70 straight months of growth with that multi-billion dollar impact, we may hit 15 million tourists this year. Last year we thought we were gonna hit 14 million, we actually got to about 14.3 million. We may actually hit 15 million visitors to, to Greater Fort Lauderdale. As you complain about that, as you worry about that, realize what economic impact that brings and it's one of those things that I tell people all the time, when you see a tourist, give them a full five finger wave, if you will, from the city of Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> And the last number I want to hit you with this morning is 4.1193. And it's a number that uh, I think in the past I've spoken to you. 4.1193 is your property tax rate. And as you look around South Florida, you realize that that's a pretty darn low rate. It is actually the rate that we had when we started. Uh, 4.1193 is now, we were just notified by the state of Florida, we are now the lowest property tax rate of the 25 largest cities in the state of Florida. So as we took off back in 09 and we came into office and I came with a great group of guys, two of them still serving with me. One, uh, Romney Rogers, you all know Romney, fantastic guy, first class. Uh, talk about a guy that builds community. Romney Rogers knows how to build community. But Romney came in, he came in in a very fiscally conservative manner. Uh, Bruce Roberts came in. Many of you know Bruce Roberts from being around here. Bruce, the former chief of police. Um, six years as the chief of police, 35 years on our department force. The three of us have served together now for seven years. We have never raised this tax rate, this 4.1193. We've added two additional commissioners recently, guys, two great guys, you really ought to have them come here and just say a few words. One, Robert McKenzie, who by the way, went to St. Anthony with Danny and I back in 1977. And the other is Dean Trantalis, who represents a lot of the beach area. But both those guys, a great team to work with. But that 4.1193 is a very significant number because now being the lowest property tax rate in the state of the 25 largest cities, it gives us an unbelievable ability to compete. It gives us the ability to recruit businesses. Steve Palmer will tell you he deals with this stuff all the time with styles. When you want to be able to bring businesses into town, one of the first things they ask you, well, probably the first thing they ask you is your education system. How is it? What do you have? We've got our executives. We've got our officers. We've got our you know, families. How's the education system? The second thing they ask is usually, how's the tax rate? And here in Fort Lauderdale, we're very blessed. We have the lowest property tax rate. On top of that, we have a, the lowest, what they call tourism tax rate of the 50 largest destinations in the country. Uh, how many of y'all travel a lot? Who can tell me where you think the highest tourism tax rate of any city in the country? Who said Chicago? John did, John's right. John's on a roll today, guys. This is. <laughs> Should we all just go great or something for that? Great. <laughs> In all seriousness, fifth, Chicago's the highest. If you go there, you ever, you know, you get there, you got a McCormick tax, McCormick place tax, you got a uh, tourism tax, got a rental car tax, you got a hotel tax, a pillow tax. They hit you every which way. 
but we were just ranked as having the lowest tax of the 50 largest destinations, so it's kind of cool. But as you move forward and you look at that, you realize we have, we have no income tax, we have low property tax, we have a low tourism tax. It is a very attractive destination to keep this growth going, which leads me to my last point. As we move forward with all this tremendous growth, these tremendous numbers, the, the 70 straight months, the 4.9% unemployment, the, the, the 4.11 tax rate, We've got to somehow figure out how to balance all this. And Danny touched on that, and it was actually an interesting quote, because we've got to somehow make sure that we can preserve your quality of life, be able to move people around paradise. As I've said, we live in paradise. We live in the greatest city anywhere. But if we can't move people around from a uh, traffic standpoint, if we can't find people to be able to park to get to and from your businesses, we're going to have a significant problem. And so that's the, that's the biggest challenge we probably have right now in Fort Lauderdale is transportation and parking going forward. It is going to be something that we'll need your help on. We need you to help not only address issues of transportation and parking, but address how we change behavior. The old concept in Fort Lauderdale back in the days of Mayor Bob Cox and, and Mayor Jim Noggle and you know Ted's here will tell you is what you know how do we move cars around the town? Really how do you move cars? How do you move vehicles? The new concept is how do we move people? How do we move our neighbors? Because we're kind of past the stage where we got to just worry about moving cars. We've got to move people. And that's going to be a transition to more uh, mass transit, the wave project coming on board, the sun trolleys you see. How many of you all have been on our sun trolley? I see a couple hands go up. Let me give you an idea of what's happened with sun trolley. Sun trolley has now surpassed a half million in ridership this year around, around Greater Fort Lauderdale. It's that trolley that you see that you probably, most of you never even think about. Because you grew up here and you know how to get places, you know how to move around. That has now passed a half million in ridership. And the craziest thing about that is that's about the fifth or sixth largest transportation system now in the state. Obviously, you have Broward County Transit is you know one or two, depending on the month, Miami-Dade Transit, one or two. You start looking at those other numbers and you realize that little local sun trolley is now getting up there a pretty significant number. And we need to keep that going. Because if you're seeing a half million people moving by that sun trolley, imagine if they were in their vehicles. Imagine if they're in their cars, what that does to our downtown transit, downtown commerce. And so as we move forward, it's gonna take organizations like the executives to be able to tell us, how do we address transit in, in Greater Fort Lauderdale? How do we move people around? Uh, we'll be coming to talk to you. We'll be coming to get your advice and your input. Uh, you all had some very nice things to say about me this morning. I will tell you this, it's a team. I have an amazing group at City Hall. Uh, you get a chance, you run into Bruce Roberts, thank him. The guy is such a joy to serve with. You run into Romney Rogers, thank him. You have a chance to interact with Lee Feldman, be sure you thank him. Great city manager, and it's a great team that we have working together. Um, Robert McKenzie, Dean Trantalis, thank those guys. They really have been wonderful to work with. And so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity this morning. I'll actually take a few questions. I, as I look around, I'm sure there'll be a few that might have a couple questions about what's happening here in the city. But at the end of the day, I really want to thank you all because it's a great opportunity for me to speak, but it's even a greater privilege for me to speak to a group that has built Fort Lauderdale, that has really made Fort Lauderdale. If you ever look at your roster, take a step back, look at it objectively without the subjective relationships you have, you realize you guys are who put Fort Lauderdale on the map. Let me correct that. You guys and gals are who put Fort Lauderdale on the map. And it's so important that you all continue to do what you do, because at the end of the day, the number one way to build this community is through the business community, through commerce, through trade. And that's really the direction we need to keep going. So uh, take a question, Mr. Whitten. Jack, I couldn't agree with you more about the cohesiveness of your team. And I was just curious, uh, how much longer will you all be a team together? Well, I'm term limited in uh, 2018, and so I will serve as mayor until 2018, and then I think you'll probably have, uh, you know, one of those other four competing for the job. Uh, and I tell you what, um, unbelievable group. It's going to be a tough decision to see who, who does that, but uh, we'll, we'll be working together for another couple of years. And, um, you know, like I said, I've been very blessed timing-wise to be able to, ch you know, chance to serve with the guys that I mentioned. It's been an amazing run. But it's been a really good team effort. I mean, you know, you talk about I get here and there, but they get everywhere too, and it's it's been awesome. Yes. You mentioned education. Uh, a guest came in with a lady named Fishler with a 
President of Emeritus and Ohio University. Today's paper announced the opening of the stem cell research facility at Nova, South, Nova Southeastern University. And that's a milestone. That's the kind of things that we should applaud and look forward to and support with the leadership. No, I agree. And let me tell you, first of all, about, I mean, obviously, I've known Abe for a long time, and he's, he's a legend here in the greater Fort Lauderdale area. But let me just also comment about Nova for a second. Every great city, every great city has to have a great higher ed system, not just pre-K through 12, but you have to have a great higher education uh, system. NOVA has been able to elevate Fort Lauderdale in the process because NOVA, you know, we don't have a school based here. FAU is based out of Boca. They've now expanded their presence in Fort Lauderdale, and that's been awesome. But NOVA really stepped up and became our higher education system. And now the combination of NOVA under the leadership of, of George Hanbury, who used to work for the city of Fort Lauderdale, city manager. You look at John Kelly at FAU, another just fantastic uh, administrator. And then David Armstrong, for those of you who know David Armstrong, the guy is a rock star. About You talk about a guy building community, I'm sure Kathleen, you know. I mean, if you do an event at United Way, he will be there. And you look at those three leaders now heading up our college and university system, Fort Lauderdale needed that to get to where we are today. And they've now elevated the city in elevating their educational system. So I hope you all continue to support those three programs because it's amazing. And Abe, Abe built one of those schools. And I'll tell you what, did an amazing job. Jody? Uh, I have two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. um, curious about, you mentioned traffic, the fast train that's coming up in 2017. All I, aboard Florida. Yep. Right, OK. I understand it's supposed to pass through the city 32 times in a day. I might have that number wrong. That's one question. The other question is your position on uh, prohibiting fishing on the beach. Well, the, the, the easy one is my position on prohibiting fishing on the beach. I think fishing is a great activity. I think fishing is an activity that is probably given more father and sons and mothers and daughters and parents and children an opportunity to talk about stuff as they fail to catch fish but make a great effort to try to fish. <laughs> And I am not going to do anything that would prohibit or restrict fishing on Fort Lauderdale Beach. I think that's something we need to have here in the community. Some people are saying, oh, as we're coming this world-class destination, we got to get the rods off the beach. I think it adds to the whole sense of community. I think people want to see that activity out there. So that's not going to change. And um, we won't do anything about these flyboard either. So who was the guys going off to do the flyboard? There you are. Jeez. I thought, what a coincidence. Two of us going over there to do the same thing. That's really cool. <laughs> Uh, second thing, the All Aboard Florida. Um, that is really an amazing concept that's being proposed. But All Aboard Florida is going to bring uh, 16 trains going north and 16 trains going south through Fort Lauderdale. But as a result of the, the original plan was to go from Miami to Orlando, we were able to get a stop here in Fort Lauderdale. As a result of us being able to get a stop, we were also able to negotiate a lot of very favorable terms. The first of which is we're going to create what they call a quiet zone all the way through Broward County. We're actually working on that right now with the federal government. I was up there a couple months ago, but there will be a quiet zone so that they don't have to be blowing those horns. If you can secure the intersections, they don't have to blow the horns. If you have an unsecured intersection, they have to blow those horns. So obviously the goal is as we bring this train through to secure all the intersections properly, we can create a quiet zone through the city so those of you that don't want to hear that train horn at 2 in the morning or 4 in the morning, you get that relief. And so that's really a good thing that's come out of this. The second thing is, is that because of the bridge at the river, we were able to negotiate with them opening time and, and, and closing times. And as a result, we actually got a very favorable opening and closing time that the marine industry has kind of agreed with that they can live with going up the river. And that is now ground zero. So all the crossings happen simultaneously there, to 16 north, to 16 south. Always the zero, uh, ground zero on that is, is the railroad bridge here in Fort Lauderdale. So that'll time it. The third thing is people don't realize when you're talking about these trains, you're thinking of these big trains that come out of Port Everglades and these trains that go north-south, up and down the coast. These trains will be in, through an intersection in less than a minute. So we're not talking about, this is high-speed rail. So remember, picture, this is going to be, the, the, it's going to go down, be closed for less than a minute, they come through, and then it goes back up. So you're going to see closings more frequently 
but actually much quicker because they actually, the timing on these things, they get through the intersection like 45 seconds in the city. And then you got maybe a minute on each side, so that's quick. And the last thing we negotiated also was that the railroad bridge at the river will actually have a bridge tender. So now it is open and closed from Jacksonville. So I don't know how many of y'all are, you know, boaters, but you know when you're caught at that bridge, most frustrating thing in the world is you pull up, it goes down, and you know a train's coming, and about 20 minutes later, the train comes through. Then you sit there for a while, and about 20 minutes later, it opens back up, and everybody says, man, you know, what the heck happened? That's being done out of Jacksonville. They don't have that visual ability to fully look at that whole bridge, so they just err on the side of caution, opening and closing. That will now have a bridge tender in downtown Fort Lauderdale. So when that does open and close, one, it'll be, like I said, much quicker, but two, even for the uh, cargo and freight trains, there'll now be a full-time bridge tender there that'll be able to open and close a lot quicker. So all board Florida should be ready to go by the end of like 2017. We're looking at that time frame, but it's gonna be amazing, folks. You'll be going to and from Orlando on high-speed rail, and uh, the station's right in downtown Fort Lauderdale next to City Hall. You'll be able to pull into Orlando, pull into West Palm, and pull into Miami. Those are the only four stops they're allowing, but it really will be amazing for our tourism and moving people around instead of moving cars. Yes? I have a question. In, like, uh, you know, our business is on Sunrise Boulevard. We live in Coral Ridge. But that whole section of Federal Highway going from, let's just say, 26th Street all the way around Sunrise Boulevard is, is like a parking lot often. Do you guys have any plans to solve that issue? We're actually working with DOT on that now. Believe me, that is probably Sunrise Boulevard and Oakland Park Boulevard probably give us more headaches than any streets you can imagine. And the, and the problem we're having with that is, you know, we wanted the upgrade to the Middle River Bridge. We were the ones that asked them to raise that bridge. So that project, when they were already going to replace it, we got them to raise it, which helped the property values up the river because you can get a little taller boat in now going up through uh, Sunrise Intercoastal, then you go up through, um, you know, George English Park and up that way. Well, we raised that bridge, but that project has gone on now for about 18 months. It is a very difficult project from a traffic standpoint. So what happens is now people are now, you know, tired of going that way. That whole Sunrise Boulevard intersection, Gateway Cinema, Gateway Theater, has just become a nightmare. We're working on plans with DOT now. We hope to have something rolled out in the next probably six to nine months. But again, it's just the reality of, you know, as I said, the numbers, 15 million tourists coming to the greater Fort Lauderdale area. I have a follow-up question. I don't know personally about the whole thing, but do you, can you give us a quick synopsis on what I've heard is a huge uprising in Sunrise Intracoastal area being upset about these multi like multi-family condo projects that you guys are going to try to well someone's trying to build behind the Galleria Mall well first of all it's not you guys because okay. we're uh, these are not our projects uh, <laughs> you know let, let me well I know but let me let me just say and, and Steve will probably vouch for me on this you know we have had people don't really understand what's happening we probably have dozens of projects brought forward now about every week I even had one I won't mention who did it but I had one that actually was brought forward went to ULI, which is the institute that does this, Urban Land Institute, and won an award, and had never been presented to us at City Hall. So I get a call from the Urban Land Institute to ask me about this beautiful project that just won an award at their national convention, and they said, well, what's the city's feeling on this? You know, how soon is it gonna be up? How excited are you? And I said, I don't even know how to tell you this, but that has never been submitted to the city. The architect actually took the plans, took it to Urban Land Institute, won an award thinking that would be the better way to get it approved coming back to the city. That project's never been built, by the way. Galleria, the proposal you're talking about is a, a group of uh, the owners of Galleria Mall had, had asked to do about 1,800 units at the Galleria Mall. Um, they worked it, took it out in the community. Um, it has never ha had a vote at City Hall. I don't support 1,800 units at the Galleria Mall. I don't think we can handle 1,800 units at the Galleria Mall. Uh, something will get done there, but something will get done when we address issues of parking and traffic. Because it goes back to, you know, we can have, like I said, paradise, but if we can't move around paradise, there's no purpose in having it. And we got to preserve this quality of life. And to put a urban, you know, dense urban project in a residential area is not a solution. I'm all about density downtown. The styles people will tell you, I believe our downtown corridor has to have density. 
if the wave's going to make it, if the trolley's going to make it, if all aboard Florida's going to make it, if we're going to create this walkable 24-7 downtown where you can live, work, play, we have to have density down there. It does not have to be in our residential neighborhoods. It should not be in our residential neighborhoods. We need to identify the areas where we want density, bring the density to those areas, and in other locations, we need to be very selective in what we approve and how we approve it. Uh, a couple examples on the beach, we just approved Four Seasons just came in. Very, you know, very impressive for the city to get a Four Seasons. I met with those guys two years ago. Almost had to negotiate with them. If I released information, they were like, they don't want to come. That's how secretive the Four Seasons was. But they're now coming. We got Paramount coming to Fort Lauderdale Beach. We're in, we got all bears coming to Fort Lauderdale Beach. We have, you know, probably three of the top ten hotel chains in the world coming to Fort Lauderdale Beach to go with our existing ones like the Riverside and, and, and the, the Ritz and, the, you know, those. It's going to be an amazing run. But we're not just approving projects to approve projects. We want good, high-quality projects moving forward because we have to be very careful how many trips we put on the Barrier Island, how many vehicles we put on the Barrier Island. So um, right now along the Sunrise Corridor, we're counting trips constantly. That's why you always see all these things across the road. That's us trying to figure out traffic because uh, you know we're all for good development, good projects, working with developers like Styles that do it right. We're not just going to develop for development's sake. It's not going to happen. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to speak. <laughs> and I'll be happy to come back anytime. Let me just remind you all, though, uh, it was mentioned earlier by Rob, but Winterfest Bowl Parade coming up. Make sure you all get out for that. It is a great event for Fort Lauderdale. And in closing, happy Thanksgiving, everybody.